Bias and error are pretty much unavoidable for everybody, students through experts. Um, this is every sphere of your life um, and it relates also to manual therapy. So bias is not always a terrible thing. You use bias um, as a heuristic sometimes, we'll come to that. Um, but bias can also lead to error. Anyway, bias, we'll briefly define it now and more later on, but it's a favouring of a particular outcome or judgment or conclusion or a method, but something you prefer to do over everything else. So this comes to the forefront of your mind. Um, prejudice, on the other hand, is prejudgment. You've already made your decision, um, made your judgment, determined your methodology based on no real evidence whatsoever. And it's mostly caused by stereotyping, but also from cultural learning, what you picked up from your parents um, and the culture you live in there in manual therapy. It's the culture that you live in as well as stereotyping. Um, you live in a culture at the moment of manual therapy. So you're going to favor everything manual therapy over everything else. Um, this is bias and you have to overcome it. Error on the other, other hand is a mistake. Um, it's an accident, an unintentional um, issue. It may be an omission, miscalculation, misinterpretation, mistest, but you've made a mistake and it's an honest mistake. Now, bias can and does lead to error if it's not counted. But error can occur through means other than bias. It can be from carelessness, distraction, and any number of other non-biased, random, non-systematic um, causes. This is a random error, and it's more difficult to deal with as it can be hard to identify at the time. For example, um, you're diagnosing a patient, planning treatment. During the diagnosis phase, you make a mistake. You use the wrong test. You misinterpret the test result. Uh, you do the test badly, and you end up with a different diagnosis to what it should be. Now, you plan the treatment on that diagnosis, and the treatment doesn't work because they've got a different problem. When the prognosis doesn't meet um, what you expected it to meet is a time to review both the diagnosis and the treatment plan and, of course, your actual treatmentology, as it were, um, your treatment methods and your ability to do these treatments. So um, this is when you will pick up, if you do it properly, random errors and then you can correct them. But it's probably it's much more difficult than dealing with bias. Um, even identifying it can be difficult as well because then bias kicks in there as well when you're trying to identify the bias from confirmation and um, anchoring. You've done the treatment. It's not your fault the treatment's not working. It's the patient's fault and everything you learn confirms that. So error can be really difficult. This presentation will look at defining bias and error and their subtypes and various ways of mitigating their effects. Bias, as I said, is a tendency towards the favoured position, a favourite um, judgment, favourite method. Um, it's a prefer preference. Um, it actually comes from old French meaning slant. So you take a particular slant on a thing and off you go. Um, the definition you've got on the, the chalkboard there is technically the definition of bias. You're not going to use it. Um, it's up there for completeness sake more than anything else. Just understand that it could be conscious or unconscious. We've discussed consciousness. Know it's there. Deal with it. Um, you can't do that with implicit um, bias, which is subconscious. So you have to assume it's there. Basically, you've got to assume that you have biases and you have to deal with them at the time. So these biases are hidden. And they will affect your decision. Now, we're talking about manual therapy now. So this is going to affect your decision as to which hypothesis um, you're going to choose. Uh, it will affect your decision on how much information you take in um, as to whether it confirms or it contradicts that hypothesis and how much you want it to do one or the other, um, and so on. This will influence your decision. Prejudice, on the other hand, doesn't influence your decision. It makes a decision for you. Um, so there's nothing we can do about that. 
except get rid of the prejudice, which is not the easiest thing in the world at all. So while you can't, with an effort of will, get rid of bias, it doesn't happen, I'm sorry. Uh, you cannot wish it away, apart from explicit bias. You have to take concrete steps, and that's what most of this um, presentation is about, taking those concrete steps. So by all means, have a look at the uh, menu. Try to understand it. Um, but just consider this. It is systematic. It's going to happen every time you deal with a problem. Um, it's not a one-off. It's not like a random error. Um, it's there. And uncountered, it is likely to cause errors. On the other hand, if you get it right the first time, it's actually going to be a nice shortcut into the correct judgment. So as I said, a heuristic is a shortcut um, to a problem. That's a bias. And when you everything's going well for you, that heuristic will save time and trouble and make things a whole lot easier. But when it's not working, it will lead you to be wrong. An error is a mistake. I've said this before, but it still is a mistake. Um, you screwed up. Now, it's unintentional. If it's not unintentional, then it's not a mistake. Um, but basically, it could be anything from miscalculation, doing the incorrect test, doing the test, the correct test incorrectly. Um, asking the wrong questions, interpreting the questions wrongly. Um, you're making a mistake, it happens. So uh, there can be two types of mistakes. One's bias based, which is systematic, and the other one is random, which is non-systematic. Um, the bias based error, you can deal with by dealing with the bias, but the random errors are really difficult to deal with the chances are you won't know the errors occurred until you started treating the patient and the prognosis is not working out for you. That is, the expected results of the treatment are not coming to fruition. That then means that you've got to look back over the whole process, the diagnostic process, treatment planning, and the execution of the treatment to find out where the mistake was made. Not an easy thing to do, but it has to be done. One of the larger groupings for bias and errors. Bias can either be implicit, that is, the subject doesn't know it's there. Um, it's in the subconscious and it does its work in the background. Or it could be explicit where the person does know it's present. Now, let's look at explicit biases first. If you have explicit biases, and you don't do anything to count with them, they actually become prejudice. Um, it's a prejudgment, and you're required to do whatever that prejudice tells you to do. Um, <coughs> excuse me. If, um, let me give you an example of an explicit bi um, bias in manual therapy. You are manual therapists, and what you'll see in a general practice, manual therapy general practice, on manual therapy cases. You'll see the odd disc, you'll see the odd um, fracture, bits and pieces, you'll see different stuff, but the majority of it is gonna be biomechanical dysfunction you can treat with manual therapy. This will give you that bias, and the problem with it is, is it makes it an availability bias. And if it sticks, then you're not gonna see other conditions. You're not going to see medical conditions. Um, you're not going to see serious problems. You, you know, this stuff just isn't going to occur to you because of your um, explicit bias. So it's a reasonable one. It's availability, really. I mean, this is what you see commonly. You see the other ones less commonly or not at all. And so this is reasonable. The problem with it is that um, when it does happen, and you don't take into account your explicit bias, then those things become manifest and they can be a real problem for everybody. So if you, haven't, if you know that you've got a bias, then you should probably do something about it um, at the time of dealing with the patient. That's an explicit bias. Implicit, you don't know it's there um, and it's just working in the background. It's influencing your decisions, um, your methodology and so on. 
you've got preferred ways of doing it and that's what you'll go back to. It's sort of regression to a familiarity. Um, so it's present. You need, again, to acknowledge the fact that there is biases present and you need to do something about it. And we'll talk about that for the rest of the um, video. This is, that's biases. For errors, error can be based on the bias and often is. In fact, generally speaking, an, un, an, unencountered, an uncounted bias will lead to error. Um, so, you can deal with it by dealing with the bias. It, it, they just follow on. Deal with the bias, you deal with the biased errors. Um, but random biases are non-systematic. They're not based on um, a bias. They're random, and it could be due to carelessness, um, distraction, inexperience with the technique, um, all sorts of things, bad communication with the patient, uh, boredom, tiredness, overwork, um, constrain time limits you might have from your employer and so on. So there's a number of reasons why random errors crop up and they will crop up. Everybody makes mistakes. Um, and the problem I said earlier is it's really difficult to identify these as they're happening. Um, you will look back on your diagnosis and treatment plan when the prognosis that you made isn't being met. So this is really what a prognosis is for. It's not to tell the patient what's going to happen. That's part of it. But the main thing is so that you can check your expectations against reality. Um, so when the prognosis isn't coming out the way you expected it to or isn't working for you, then you go back, check the, the diagnostic process, the, um, the treatment planning process and the treatment and look for an error. We're going to look at the different types of bias now. There's 500 biases in the world, 900,000, 10,000, I have no idea. But there's an awful lot of them. Um, in clinical reasoning, uh, they'll be reported as a subset, so there'll be a large number in clinical reasoning as well. The thing is that a lot of these are simply slight variations on a theme for a particular bias. Sometimes the bias will have four or five different names and slight variations in the definition, but it's the same bias. So don't get overly um, caught up on the names as much as I love I think I've used the most common names for these, um, but look at what they mean rather than the label. So we'll look at availability bias first. Availability means it's the first thing that comes to mind, essentially. It's top of your mind, and it may be because um, it's the most common thing you see, and so everything uh, becomes that. It may be you've been to on a course or something, and this has been the subject of that course, and it's stuck. Maybe you've seen a couple of these in the last three weeks or so, and they've stuck as well. It may be that you've seen a really rare case, and that's come to the fore. So um, this is what available bias is. It's whatever is top of the list for that particular problem. Now, it may not be an issue. Availability bias is an excellent heuristic. It's a shortcut, and it will lead you most often to the right diagnosis. Let's look at an example, lateral elbow pain. The availability bias for nearly everyone in manual therapy would be it's a tennis elbow, common extensive of tendinopathy. Um, and the reason is because with lateral elbow pain, that's going to be the most common cause of it. Um, so... If that's the most common cause, most of the time you're going to be right. But occasionally you're going to see something there that isn't a common extensive tendinopathy and you're going to say it is and it's going to screw everything out. So um, you've got to check this bias. Confirmation bias follows on from availability bias, actually. Um, but it also comes into anchoring bias and a few others, which we'll see in a second. So really what confirmation bias is, is that whatever your favourite hypothesis, whether it's the first one, whether it's um, the one that you want it, to, want it to be because you know how to treat that one best, it doesn't really matter. What confirmation bias does is it will upgrade the supporting information and downgrade the, con the um, contrary information. Or you'll completely ignore the information that is not supporting your hypothesis or you will exaggerate the information that it is. I remember um, doing a residency with a therapist once and um, 
he sat there and took the history off the patient and he came up with the biomechanical dysfunction. So I said, well, what about the severity of the back pain and the fact that it goes down the leg? So he said, he never said it went down the leg. And I said to the patient, does it go down your leg? He said, yeah. I said, did you tell me that? He said, yeah. He just completely lost that. Um, and it actually turned out to be a, 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 a contained herniated disc. So this is what confirmation bias is. It confirms your belief. Anchoring bias is a little different from confirmation bias, but not that much difference, but it, it's the cause of it that is different. So um, anchoring bias is basically you grab hold of a piece of information that may be making the most sense um, or a hypothesis and you cling to it. Doesn't matter what comes in, that's your answer to it. And so, and this is often caused by um, being overwhelmed by the information coming in. So um, none of it's making sense. You're getting too much, you're getting overloaded and you grab the first thing that makes any sense and you cling to it like a life raft. Um, work overload, this is, more usually this is an error rather than a bias, but work overload, whether you're getting too much work in or your time for stress is too much, can lead you to believe that you just don't have time to do stuff when in fact you often do. And it doesn't matter how simple the case is, it's too much. So um, this bias will exaggerate sometimes the amount of work you have to do in the amount of time you've got to do it. So, um, but mostly work overload is an error. It's not an error on your part, it's an error on your employer's part, but that error makes you make errors as well. Fifth on our list is search satisfaction or premature closure. Um, this is when you end the examination too soon. Um, now, this can be caused by other biases. Uh, this can be caused by confirmation bias. You've got enough information to confirm your know, diagnosis and that's what you want. You're not going to look at it anymore. You're good. Um, anchoring will do the same thing. So what availability biases. So um, this is less of a bias than it is a result of biases. But nonetheless, it's included in bias. Um, the... This happens a lot. Again, um, workload, overloading, time constraints so on can also cause this problem. The only real way out of this bias is to complete the exam. And you're not gonna do that on every case because it's unnecessary in every case. In fact, I make the point uh, of using the essential illness script, which is a very abbreviated uh, list of diagnostic criteria for each condition. So you don't have to do the full exam, but occasionally you'll find that this isn't working for you. You're not getting the diagnosis too complicated. You've got other things going on and you're going to need to do a full exam. So that's search satisfaction. Framing um, is the presentation of material information before you actually see the patient. Now, this can be in the form of um, the way the information is presented to you, or it can be a certain type of information. So if you're getting a, um, diagnosis given to you, uh, you're looking at lab results that actually give you the diagnosis, then um, that's called diagnostic momentum. If the lab report or x ray suggests um, findings that suggest a diagnosis to you, that's called framing. It doesn't matter, they're the same thing, you're doing the same mitigations on them. This is just pedantic twaddle as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it makes no difference on a practical level. So we're just going to use framing. It's when you're presented with information prior to making your diagnosis. Now, that prior information can be lab tests, x-rays, and so on. It can also be the patient's checklist. If you're asked them to check off stuff before, when they sign in before you see them, don't look at it. That will give you, will help frame you. So don't look at it. Look at it afterwards. Look upon that checklist as a legal tool, because if you forget to ask some of the, the, the Later on, if there's a malpractice, it becomes important. It has been asked. It was asked on the form. If they didn't answer it on the form, then basically it's their problem. It was asked. Look at the form after you've made the diagnosis. So, danger obsession is, it's really not a bias. It's a behavioral problem. It's an obsession. We're looking for too much information. Doing too many tests, um, asking too many questions, and just getting obsessed with the whole thing about information gathering, which is the other name for this bias. Um, all I can tell you is stop it. 
I, you know, I can't do anything about your obsessions. You need to do something about that. Um, and the last one on this list is base rate neglect. Now, what the base rate is, it's giving you information about prevalences and incidents. So that if you make a diagnosis that's extremely rare um, and you ignore the fact that it is extremely rare, you're likely to be wrong. Um, I would ignore base rate in the first place because that can bias you as well. If um, you're coming, if you look at the base rates for a condition you're considering and it's common, then you're more likely to say it's that. If it's rare, you're more likely to say it's not that. So what the base rate does is, is give you a probability of a hypothesis being correct before you actually get any information from the patient. So um, don't do it. I would look at the base rate if you really want to after you've made the diagnosis again and make sure that if it's coming up as a rare disease that you really believe it is there. If it's a common disease that you're not making that based on the assumption that it's common. Don't look at the base rate, then you won't anyway if I know anything about people. Don't look at the base rate before you make the diagnosis. Bias and error mitigation begins in childhood really. Uh, but we're talking manual therapy. So this stuff should have been worked into your school. Um, these are principles, actually, on um, how you learn and how you practice. So uh, we won't spend too long on these. Some of these are self-evident, and others of them sound like abstract pap. But let's see what they do. <coughs> Excuse me. The first one is be self-critical. You're not as good as you think you are. Nobody is. Um, be self-critical. If you're not self-critical, nothing in this video um, applies to you. Uh, without self-criticism, you can learn nothing. Absolutely nothing. Um, be prepared to criticize yourself and then make good on it. Um, reflect on your practice. Now, experience is a major issue here. But experience isn't just putting in hours. There's quality experience and there's crap experience. Um, you should have realized by now that most of your colleagues um, don't engage in quality care. They don't engage in quality experience. Most of them are there just to do the job, go home, do whatever their personal life demands, and it comes back next day and pretty much do the same thing again. There's not an awful lot of um, ambition to be better with a lot of therapists, um, and that applies to all professions. Quality experience is searching for something better all the time. And the, one of the best tools you've got is to be, is to reflect on your practice, and this is where self-criticism comes in as well. Reflect on your practice, especially the cases that don't go as well as you think they should have gone, um, and see what you could have done better. Um, even in practices that turn out well, there's usually something else you can do that would have made things a bit better, if not for the patient, then for you. So reflect on your practice. Don't be overconfident. Again, we come back to this business about nobody's as good as they think they are. Um, and actually, as you get further and further towards proficiency, mastery and expertise, your confidence actually starts to drop. Um, this is a Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, as you learn more, you become a little less confident, and that's a good thing. Um, you all know um, practitioners, surgeons in particular, who are arrogant, um, and they're, they're good, uh, but they can't be wrong. And this is not, not, a pretty, not a pretty sight, and also it's not great practice. They'll be great until something comes up, and they've got to learn something new, and then they're going to be in trouble. Um, don't worry about detail. Techniques are techniques. You can get them anywhere. What you need to do is understand principles, concepts, um, the big picture, processes, the big stuff. If you've got the big stuff down, you can work out the small stuff for yourself. You need to understand and apply anatomy and pathology. They're your two main clinical sciences. Um, and apply clinical reasoning to those, and then you'll be able to do almost anything. Um, but it's the big stuff that's really important, not the um, 
none of the minor details. Try to develop your own structures and processes for diagnosis, for treatment, for assessment, and so on. Um, if you develop the process, you'll understand it better. And, and basically, a good process is a good process, and you'll end up with as much the same process as everybody else um, if they have a process. But your processes are not routinely applied to every patient who comes in. You'll have a different system for dealing with a post-trauma patient than you will do for a, a non-trauma patient. For example, you'll have different systems for somebody with neurological symptoms than somebody without. And of course, patient's personality will kick in as well, and that will change uh, how you process that patient's information. So um, it's not, I'm not trying to straightjack it here, but you should have an overall structure um, that you can work with, not under. Um, keep your workload. Actually, I'd suggest below your level of confidence and not at your level of confidence. Um, if you're working at your level of confidence, you're going to be exhausted. So keep it low. I have a friend who has hot pack days. He's a really, really top-notch therapist. And he says every now and then he'll have a day where he does nothing, basically. Um, well, it involves a lot of deep thought. So you have a hot pack day. Everybody gets a hot pack. Everybody gets their exercise reviewed. And it's really a rest day for him. Um, and it works for him. I know the patient's being short-changed, but on the other hand, if he doesn't have it, they're probably going to be worse than short-changed. Uh, what else we got here? If I could read Mark Ryan, it would help. Oh, yeah. Understand the clinical reasoning progress. Now, everybody thinks they do, um, but it's actually a complicated process, and it's extremely effective flexible and variable and the chances are you'll never understand it in full um, I learn about stuff all the time in this so understand as much as you can develop it um, this is what your main tool is when you're dealing with patients this is an important one try to cultivate a lifelong learning strategy even if it's only one or two facts a day um, but keep in the habit of being a student. Um, but unlike university, you need to be problem solving and be a thinking student rather than a, a, a rote learner, as a lot of university courses have given now. So um, lifelong learning. And once you adjust the day attitude, you'll find it much more enjoyable. This is a biggie, and everybody doesn't like it. Neither do I. You're going to be wrong and you're going to be wrong frequently and you're going to fail frequently um embrace it this is how you learn you learn from failure you don't learn from success okay so i'm not saying you try to enjoy it you won't but learn from it um it's an opportunity to learn and i'm not saying you should enjoy it again but um you should enjoy the opportunity to learn from your failure. In fact, failure lights some areas of your brain that are involved in learning, so your brain's set for it. If you do this stuff, the result will be you'll become an expert. Uh, you know, it's, it's inevitable. Um, if you don't do this stuff, you won't be an expert. You may be competent, you may be proficient. In fact, we're hoping that you will be proficient at the end of this program. The chance of you being an expert at this end of this program is not very high. Um, but this is what you're aiming for over time. Expertise is earned by you. It's not taught to you. It's what you earn and merit from doing this job for as long as it takes. And it may be quick, it may be slow. And it's got more to do with commitment than it has to do with intelligence. All right, that's my little. We've talked about many of these biases and mitigations as an aside before. So a lot of this will go quickly. Availability bias, um, remembering that the availability um, heuristic is useful, um, but bias can be um, encountered by um, using differential diagnosis to generate the hypothesis and using the hypothesis as well. So um, 
Negative uh, exclusionary differential diagnosis is the most efficient and probably most reliable way of doing this. Highly sensitive tests to eliminate the differential diagnosis, at least provisionally, and move on to the next one. Um, confrontation, um, confirmation bias, rather. Repeat the answers back to the question, back to the patient at the end of the process once you've made the diagnosis. So repeat those questions back. Um, give a summary of your interpretation of what the patient said and see how much concordance there is between you and the patient. Now, as far as the answer is concerned, the patient knows what the answer should be. You know what you think it is. So if the patient disagrees with your interpretation of their answer, you're wrong. If the patient disagrees with your interpretation of the examination process, then you may not be wrong. Um, you know more about this than they do, and you know better how to interpret their responses. But it will make you think about things a bit more. Anchoring. We haven't spent as much time on this as I would have liked, so we'll do it now. Anchoring um, is caused by a number of different features, but probably the main ones are overload, either work overload, time constraints, and so on. Um, and the only solution to this is basically slow down. If you can't do that, change your job. Um, but information overload, focus your exam on the diagnosis. That's the first thing. Don't get into extraneous matters um, such as family life, activity levels and so on. These come in later on in the exam. So concentrate on the diagnosis during the diagnosis phase. That will cut down the information an awful lot. Um, have a structured way of checking the hypothesis. So it's not random questions, they follow on from each other in a logical, rational manner so that you're not getting confused with the answers. I would use script focus hypothetic abduction in lieu of pattern recognition. Um, this will abbreviate that all of the questions and make them specific to the condition that you are hypothesizing. Overconfidence and arrogance are two other matters. The differential diagnosis process will, to some extent, mitigate overconfidence. Arrogance, change your personality. Um, and then the last one I want to speak about is labelling with a diagnosis. Diagnosis labels tend to seem final and it's difficult to get off them once they're made. So don't use diagnosis as your initial label. It's a hypothesis. And you understand that a hypothesis is a mere speculation that you can falsify. So um, use the scientific terminology, generate a hypothesis, prove it as far as you can anyway, and that now becomes your provisional diagnosis. Don't make the diagnosis your first step because you will anchor to that. And then lastly, I want to speak about framing, which we've spoken about a few times now. This is really quite simple. Whether it's framing or diagnostic momentum, don't read anything before you start the diagnostic process. Don't speak to anybody about the patient. Don't look, if you're doing a consult with somebody, don't look at their note to you. Um, nothing, go in there blind as far as probabilities are concerned. Last three, premature closure. Um, the indications for this is you can't make a diagnosis. Um, you need more information. Generally speaking, though, when that happens, the diagnosis can relieve you anyway, um, if you've done what you've done so far properly. Uh, usually it comes when the treatment's not working and you go back and review your diagnostic process and you can't find much wrong with it. It's probably simply that you haven't got enough information. So this is another indication to do um, a full exam. But before you make the diagnosis, before you make the diagnosis, um, differential diagnosis is probably the way to go here. Um, it's going to make you think of different things. You're going to have to examine each of these things. If exclusion differential diagnosis can't exclude that differential, you're going to have to examine it um, properly. So script focus hypothetic um, abduction done to two or three differential diagnoses is probably going to give you the full exam anyway. This isn't usually much of a problem unless this is caused by time constraints on the work overload. And again, the solution to that is reduce your workload. And if you can't do that, change jobs. But either way, reduce your overload. Um, data obsession. Pack it in. Um, 
it's an obsession. You need to get over it and, and realise I'm saying something that most psychologists would beat me about the head with a wet cod with. But um, I can't give you any other advice. Stop doing it. Um, and if you need help, stop it and get help. If you're obsessive about one thing, you're probably obsessive about other things as well. Nothing I can help you with here. Base rate neglect. As I say, I don't think ignoring the base rate or neglecting the base rate is a terrible thing because the base rate may actually bias you um, with prior probabilities. So, but make sure that if you're coming up with a rare diagnosis, look at the incidence and prevalences of that as well. So if you're going to look at base rates, look at them after you've made the diagnosis and certainly not beforehand. Um, okay, there you go. That's uh, how you how you may be able to mitigate bias, or at least reduce it to levels that are manageable. The correction of bias based or systematic error is simple. In principle, correct the bias. Once you do that, any errors produced by that bias are going to be at least lessened, if not eliminated. Um, so all the stuff we've talked about before, um, just correct the bias and you'll correct the error. The first big error is knowledge gaps. You just don't have the relevant knowledge for what you're doing. Fill them. Um, don't read textbooks, don't read papers without purpose. Um, when you spot a knowledge gap, specifically look for that. If you're randomly reading, you're not going to focus where you need to be and you're still going to have knowledge gaps in the areas that you need it. So focus your learning at this point. Um, poor testing. Your instructor is actually a very bad example for you um, when they're teaching you techniques. And the reason for that is they do them well. It's, it looks casual, it looks easy, and it's neither of those two things. The reason it looks casual and easy for your instructor is because they've done it a lot um, and they've persisted with it. It's not, it's not easy, it's not casual when you're learning this. Don't follow their examples. Be deliberate with what you're doing. Um, and this error isn't going to show up until you have a failure with a prognosis. Um, or it's not matching the history. That's the other thing that may happen. The two parts of the exam, the subject and the objective are not matching as far as your hypothesis is concerned. You do an incomplete exam. Um, not the same as premature closure. This could be a misdirected exam. Um, you're not closing it because you think you've finished. It's just, as far as you're concerned, you have finished. And there is other things you can do. Again, this is going to show up on the prognosis failure, but it may also show up in the mismatch between the object and the subject of testing and the hypothesis you are testing. Um, just go back over it again. Um, when, you've, when you come to the conclusion it needs it. Misinterpretation, like give your interpretation to the patients and see if you've got concordance or not, and then review in the light of a lack of concordance. It isn't that the fact that they don't agree with you means you're wrong, it means that you need to look at it again. You may well be right, you know what you're doing, and they don't. Um, Distraction, boredom, tiredness can all lead to errors, obviously. Um, the only concrete advice I can give you to there is essentially don't get drunk during the weekdays. Otherwise, uh, distraction is going to occur and boredom is going to occur. All you can do is make an effort of will to not let these influence your decisions. Work overload, we've done that before. Don't overload. Let's look at a simplified diagram of how this works. You have the patient present their signs and symptoms and you have the patient profile. You don't need all the signs and symptoms and more often than not, you don't need the patient profile, neither gender, age and so on really doesn't come into the diagnosis very often. Um, so a couple of ways of doing this one is pattern recognition. And if you're a bit overconfident, you're a bit arrogant, then you'll go straight from pattern recognition into that being the diagnosis. If you're a bit more thoughtful, a bit more careful, you will attack that diagnosis with um, bias and error correction. So either way, you end up uh, with a treatment and prognosis planning. 
for us, our purposes here, we're going to go through hypothetic abduction, not differential diagnosis. So we can either generate this with an availability heuristic or some other heuristic that gives you a shortcut to a single hypothesis, um, or we can do it through um, exclusionary differential diagnosis. So, <coughs> excuse me, in both cases, um, you'll end up with H1. Now, if H1 has come from a single hypothesis here that, through a heuristic, then um, you need to go through bias and error correction. Certainly, there'll be availability bias there that you need to check on, and at the very minimum availability bias, but probably more than that. So you go through the correction, you end up with a working diagnosis if the corrections work, if the correction's okay, and it stabilizes the problem, you plan and treat prognosis. We'll come back. If you went through um, differential diagnosis, so exclusionary differential diagnosis, you don't need to do bias and error correction then, at least not for most of these, most of the biases. There are some, a few that you might want to do um, specific corrections for, but not many. So your bias and error correction is minimized. You end up at the same place, so treatment and prognosis. Now, if the, the prognosis is met, for our purposes, the diagnosis is met, and that becomes a provisional diagnosis into a final diagnosis, um, or a working diagnosis into a final diagnosis. If the prognosis is unmet, it's failed. The process has failed. You need to review the diagnosis, you need to review the treatment planning, you need to review the treatment itself and come back and redo the whole thing again. As promised, a little more detail. Um, so you get the pain location of the patient. This, you must have this. Generate H1, either through a single hypothesis or through exclusionary differential diagnosis. So if you're, it's usually going to be through availability, heuristic, whatever it is that is going to be prone to biases, and these are the biases that may be affecting it. Um, you attack the single hypothesis with an essential illness script, and it fits. We now have a provisional diagnosis. That provisional diagnosis is then attacked by um, post-DX post, uh, adjustments. So exclusion differential diagnosis again, repeat patients and answers, uh, answers and summary to the patient for confirmation bias and so on. So we run through all these, these all match up with the biases there. Attack the PDX with that. If this stabilizes, the PDX now becomes a diagnosis. If it doesn't stabilize, you generate a second hypothesis and you recycle the whole thing back again. If you've done it through exclusionary differential diagnosis, you'll get H1. If the EISI fits, um, the H1 becomes a diagnosis. If it mits fits, you're going to have to do inclusionary differential diagnosis on the rest of the ones that you threw out, or any more that you can think of. If you cannot generate H1, then you need a second opinion and refer it out. More detail, but still not that complex. All right, so a summary of what we've been talking about. Um, we're not going to use inclusionary differential diagnosis as a diagnostic method. Um, so we're going to use some form or another of hypothetic abduction. My strong suggestion is that you use script-focused hypothetic abduction and not sort of a random approach for this. Either way, though, you have to generate a hypothesis first, um, otherwise it's not hypothetic abduction. So you generate the hypothetic abduction, the hypothesis using, uh, my suggestion is you use script-focused hypothetic abduction and use the essential illness script. You generate H1. If H, or you generate or you don't. If H1 fails um, to withstand the essential illness script, then you generate H2, H3, and so on, recycling each one of those that come. Now understand though, this is not starting all over again. The second, third, fourth, subsequent hypotheses are based on the information you got from the first hypothesis, the second hypothesis, and so on. So um, previous hypotheses all feed into the new hypothesis. If 
Um, it doesn't generate a hypothesis all the way through this, then you're almost certainly going to need a second opinion. You can try doing a complete exam and try to figure it out as you're doing the exam and hope something comes up. Um, doesn't work terribly well. Or um, you can use inclusionary differential diagnosis, which again doesn't work very well. Pretty much guarantee you're going to need a second opinion or you're going to be treating blind. If H1 is supported by the essential illness script, it now becomes a professional diagnosis. The provisional diagnosis and you then attack the provisional diagnosis with bias error mitigation. If it can't withstand that attack you generate H2 through HN again. If the provisional diagnosis does stand up to the um, bias error mitigation attack then it, be, um, then it becomes your diagnosis. And from that diagnosis, you can generate um, treatment plan and a prognosis. That diagnosis is re reviewed continuously as you treat the patient and you review it in how the prognosis is coming along. Is the prognosis being met or is it not being met? Now, if it's not being met, it means that something's wrong there. You've got to review the diagnosis, the treatment, plan, the execution of the treatment and the prognosis. You may have got the prognosis wrong. If that review still supports your diagnosis and treatment plan and the prognosis, you're missing something. You need a second opinion. If the prognosis is met, then the diagnosis becomes definitive, at least as far as we can make it definitive in the clinic and you can get on with your life. The patient will respond to your treatment and leave. Okay, so I hope that helps and um, take care everybody and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.